FBC, Norristown, we are so happy to have you. Please join us in worshiping our Lord and Savior this morning with our first song. Blessed assurance. <laughs>
Please join me in our call to worship today. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God, that I am giving you today. The curse, if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. Amen. We now come to time for our service for our offering. And um, there's a lot going on in this church today. And we cannot do it without the support of the congregation and the visitors that have been blessed by what God has been doing in these walls. So we come now to we can give back financially to support what is being done and the word that is going forth. So if God has blessed you, we ask you to contribute to the work that is going on in this house with his people. Amen? Amen. And there are different ways to give. On the back of your chair, uh, there are, we got the plates here that are at the front. You can just drop in your offering. And in the back of the chairs, there are also scanning and QR codes that will take you to different ways where you can uh, provide sustenance and offering for uh, the work of the church. Amen. Let's bow our heads so we can pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the tithes and offerings that have bought into this storehouse. We pray, Lord, that you bless us to be wise stewards, that we may use it to the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you multiply it tenfold, fiftyfold, a hundredfold, so the people may be reached and hear the good news of your word. Lord, we thank you and we wait in expectations for what you will do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now we come to our connections points for some of the things that are going on in this church. And if I do forget anything, I'm sure somebody in the congregation will help me out. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we have first, we have the fellowship fund. Today's a monthly fellowship fund offering for our church family who are experiencing hardships. You all may know some people who are experiencing hardships. It's very, very encouraging when you're down and out that somebody can come and help you out. So if God has blessed you and you're able to, please contribute to our fellowship fund. Next, we have our fire preparedness. preparedness. After service today, we will have a fire drill. Reminds me like I'm back at school. Gene says, yay. So just hang around. You know, hopefully we never have to use this but we don't want to be caught off guard for, for an emergency or something happens. So we want everyone to be safe. Amen? Uh, prayer meeting tomorrow, every second Monday of the month. We have a prayer meeting in here from 6 to 7 in the sanctuary, and we pray for the community. You are all welcome. If you cannot make it, you can, on your own at that time, just send up some prayers to the Lord. But if you are able... Just to come in and for one hour, step off of that hamster wheel called the world and just spend time with our God, petitioning him and, in, and on, on the needs of those in the community. So you're all welcome. Amen? Amen. Children and youth events. This Friday at 6 p.m., we will have the children and youth. Pastor C.G., anything to add to that? Come at 6 we want all the teenagers and adolescents to come and gather together with your questions, with your concerns, bring your friends, because it's about the new generation. It's about all the generations, but this particular on Friday at 12, May 12th at 6 p.m., it's about you. So if you, even if you know an adolescent who may be in need to be encouraged or may have questions, bring them. Bring them. Amen. Then we have the Joy Club, which is for the younger kids, I believe, correct? And that'll be on Saturday, May 13th, beginning at 10.30 a.m. Volunteers are needed for the Yomo Snacks. Please sign up in the Welcome Center. There's good, tasty snacks out there. We need people to set them up. Today, today we're going to be doing something fun at the end of the service today. It's called a fire drill. And our firefighter, unfortunately, is on Zoom today because Logan is with us there. But I know that you guys will be able to help out Hi, Mr. Dad. Eugene. Hi, Dad. He's already trying to chime in there. Hi, Dad. Hi. Hi, Logan. 
Don't worry, we'll get to the firefighter part tonight and today, and you'll be able to help us all out and you'll help us do the fire drill. Are you guys used to fire drills at school? Yeah? All right. All right, well, let's, let's ask for a prayer. Yeah. All right, let's extend out our hands to our children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the drills in our life that remind us that we need to protect others, Lord. And so I ask for protection upon all our children today as they learn about you and they learn more about and they are able to worship you in a way that is pleasing to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Have fun at Kids Church. We come now time to our praises and prayer requests here in the church and on Zoom as well. Before we begin, I just want to remind you that we're always praying for our church, the leadership, the volunteers. This week, we want to pray for our watch care. We want to pray for Deb Clock, who continues, and the rest of our watch care group members that continue to take care of our entire church congregation, helping out by getting meals out to people, birthday cards, celebration cards, just friendly reminders that we as a church want to take care of them and shepherd them. Well, let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Dear Lord, we uh, come into your house today in hopes to relinquish whatever's on our hearts and our souls and our minds. The pain is unbearable for many of us that are going through pain, both emotional and physical, spiritual. We ask for guidance for those that are seeking it. We ask for guidance for people that are not seeking it. Sometimes they need a conk on the head or something like that, Lord. And hopefully we can do that nicely to the, for, for those that need that. And that we can be a witness to you, to them for you, I should say. And some days are better than others and some days are worse. And so we ask for a good day today, Lord, that we might learn something more about you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we started up a series on rules. Wag my finger at you all, right? <laughs> now, it's, uh, we, last week we talked about, um, we looked at the book of Ephesians. This thing is right in my face. I'm just going to move this down. We talked about the book of Ephesians. We talked about drinking, talked about alcohol. How it says in Ephesians not to get drunk on wine. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really say not to drink at all. And we learned that many early Christians, even Jesus, drank alcohol and the sin was not the, the drinking, so to speak, but it, it was if you drink too much, that it would, no matter what, lead to that debauchery. We also learned that illicit drugs were known as witchcraft, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this would also lead people to debauchery as well. While medicinal drugs and doctors are looked at with favor in the Bible and today, we must be careful to avoid those that are illegal. And finally, we learn that addiction is a form of sin. Whether it's drinking too much, taking those illegal drugs, smoking, even other forms of addiction, maybe eating too much, it can happen in our life. And not only mess up our own relationships with our loved ones, but most importantly, our relationship with the Lord. So that's kind of what we talked about last week. And I was talking to somebody here at the church about that. I was wondering if the word rules was, you know, the necessary word for this series. And after talking to a friend the other day about that, they suggested the word wisdom. Wisdom, which I like a lot better because God's wisdom is what keeps us in line with his word. We often get bogged down by the term rules, don't we? You come into the church for the first time and you just want to feel that love from the Lord. And here I am bombarding you with the do's and the don'ts. So if you're new here or have been fairly new. I'm sorry you get to hear these first few messages from me on that. But wisdom, wisdom is something that we're all searching for. And wisdom essentially is a similar term. Rules, commandments, wisdom. And I pray these are all synonymous to you by the end of the series. And we've been studying this because we're learning together that, and let's say this together, we must listen to the Lord's rules so that they may be instinctual to us. So today we're going to talk about tattoos. I know some church here and today have tattoos, and before you try and slip out of the church, and maybe try and get away, 
I just want you to know it's cool. It's cool. It's cool in my book, okay? Maybe you could tell me, uh, maybe show me them because I find them really awesome. We, we can't get away from tattoos, can we? Even if we wanted to. Tattoos have been around for a very long time. We know that people got them at least 5,000 years ago. Today, they're common everywhere, from, I think, of Maori communities in New Zealand and to even your very home here in America. Ch culture matters throughout all of this as well. In Japan, if you have a tattoo, you were automatically associated with the Japanese mafia, where tattoos are common uh, on, their, on their members. So you couldn't even be seated in a restaurant if you had a visible tattoo showing due to its stigma in Japan. I think of back in the day here in America when my grandparents were growing up in the 40s and the 50s and uh, these you know, tattoos were immediately linked to, to angry, law-breaking, leather-bound bikers or prisoners or tough military soldiers who did worse things during the wars that they served. You know, if I told my grandparents if, that, if they were alive today that I was planning on getting a tattoo, which, by the way, I, I don't have one yet. I don't have any tattoos, but I plan on getting one very soon, especially after writing this message today. <laughs> <laughs> they would most likely be very livid if they heard this. In their day, there was no such thing as a religious tattoo that were linked to other Christians. So those who would say that we should not get tattooed, they would often quote 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17 that you might have heard before. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. And they might follow it up with, well, would you, would you, spay, you know, spray paint graffiti in God's house? And I get that. But I might follow it up with something like, well, but do you have any artwork hanging on the walls of your house? Or maybe even here in the church. Isn't that the same? So this, this question obviously drove me to the Bible. I had to get to the answer of all of this. What does God say about tattoos? Well, in the ancient Middle East, the writers of the Hebrew Bible, they forbade tattooing. There's one specific passage that talks about that in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, which is our main passage today. Do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. So if we apply this passage in our lives, it says no tattoos. But if we're going to be consistent with the Bible, specifically the Levitical law that we're looking at in Leviticus, then there are more for us to abide by. You know what we're not supposed to do? We're not, to, we're not supposed to wear clothes made with two different types of materials. Did you know that? I mean, this shirt today, is, I think, is half, po half poly and um, half cotton, so I'm sinning right now. Don't trim your beards. Okay, I did that. I'm sinning. Don't eat red meat. Oh, probably going to do that later today. <laughs> Don't eat cheese on your hamburger. I'll probably do that as well sometime soon. Uh, I'll get to it another time for you, AJ. But it's in there, I promise. Even the next chapter of that Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 20, it says, um, talks about, it talks about how uh, any children who curses their parents, they can be stoned to death. Now, parents, before you start taking notes, hold on now, okay? <laughs> Here's what I'm trying to say. The Old Testament was written to a specific people living in a specific place during a specific time for a specific purpose. This is where we get that word context once again coming up. Not all of its teachings are necessarily translated to you and I today. But this doesn't mean that we become buffet Christians picking here and picking there and choosing what rules we want to uphold and which we want to just cast aside. Instead, I think a good rule of thumb for us, especially when reading the Bible, is what Jesus told us. He said it in Matthew 18, verse 16, he said, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
So to make a rule for ourselves from Scripture, it is best to look at the context of what the verse is talking about. But we also must find this teaching in at least multiple places in the Bible. And tattoos, unfortunately, are only really said once in the Bible. Specifically in this verse today that we looked at in Leviticus. Also, in the context, it doesn't really have much to do with us today. And you're like, wait a minute, it says don't get tattoos. Why was this written, C.G.? Why was this written? Well, you see, in their time period, the pagan worshipers, those that followed other gods, they had a common practice when a person would die. It was common for them to to make deep gashes and deep cuts upon their face and upon their body when they had lost a loved one. It was seen to them as sort of a, a respect or an offering to the supposed gods who presided over death and over the grave. So the early Israelites, they, learned, they likely learned this custom during their time as captives of Egypt. And it was done in conjunction with these cultic worship practices. So God is trying to tell them to distance themselves from this practice. Because there was such a strong correlation with pagan worship and these types of body modification. I was looking up some language scholars, uh, John Kierengard, and uh, specifically Harold Leibowitz. They note that tattoos were apparently often used in ancient Mesopotamia for marking enslaved people. And of course, in Egypt, as decorations for women of all social classes as well. So Egyptian captives, like the Israelites during Moses' time, right? We remember that in Exodus. They were branded with the name of a god, marking them as belongings to the priest or to the pharaoh at that time. But also, devotees might also be branded in the name of the god that they worshipped. So, here in Garden Leibowitz, they suggest that given the key role of the escape from Egyptian bondage in ancient Jewish law, the Torah, the beginning of the Bible, originally banned tattooing because it was this symbol of servitude that they were trying to get away from. Interestingly, though, they do write that there's one other kind of reference to tattooing. It's found in the Bible. It's found in Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 5. It describes the children of Jacob committing themselves to God. It says, some will say, I belong to the Lord. Still others will write on their hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. So here a tattoo appears to be allowable as a sign of submission, not to a human master, but to God. This ancient rabbinic, uh, these, these ancient rabbinic debates, they produced a variety of, of different theories about the meaning of this prohibition on tattooing. Some authorities believed that tattoos were only allowed if they had certain messages on them, such as, you know, the name of God or the phrase, I am the Lord, like we just saw here in Isaiah, or maybe the, the name of a pagan deity that they followed. Talmudic law, it developed around 200 CE, and it says that a tattoo is only disallowed if it is done for the purpose of idolatry. You know, worshiping idols, worshiping other gods, but not if it's intended to mark a person's enslaved status. So the book of Leviticus contains mostly priestly codes and a lot of ceremonial rules and these regulations, hence the no eating pork, things like that, which many people believe was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Check this out in Galatians chapter 3. It says, so the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So we're essentially under Jesus now. The premise here is that the New Testament believers, they aren't bound to these ceremonial laws of the Old Testament in order to just have this right relationship with God. You know, if we were to follow all these ceremonial laws to the T, then we'd be restricted from eating the pork, eating shellfish, or having certain types of haircuts or goatees. Being right, being made right with God, comes from a relationship with Jesus, friends. Not by following a strict rules or set of, set of rules or regulations. Many people today and myself would argue that these connotations, they no longer exist. 
So the way I do see this passage in the mindset of tattoos would be getting tattoos that are worshiping other gods. That's when it's wrong. If you get a tattoo that might say, like, I don't know, Hail Satan or something like that, I might say, well, it's time to cover up that bad boy, right? (laughs) We need to be mindful of these tattoos because if you ask any tattoo artist or someone who has a tattoo on their own body, it comes with a story, right? It comes with a story. There's a story, and usually a, a really great and a really meaningful one, that led them to getting that tattoo. Joyce Meyer, many of us know, is a Christian, Christian author. She put it re- in a really cool way that I found. This Isaiah verse that we mentioned before, the, the you know, branding essentially on the hands, this, it was mentioned earlier, saying that, that God has a tattoo of you on the palm of his own hands. Isn't that awesome? I think, about the, the, I think about the wounds of Jesus' hands after being pierced. He showed them to Thomas. As it showed, you know, here's, here's your name. Marked by your sins. Now healed by my death and my resurrection. I belong to the Lord. Our tattoo should probably say. And then don't forget about earrings and jewelry. This one's a little bit easier. We see it in Ezekiel 16, that the Lord is treating Jerusalem and all the Israelites as his people. They're talking about a feast that he would give to us as as he cherishes us. Verses 11 and 12 say, I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck, and I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. And then contrast that to, say, in Hosea chapter 2, verse 13, it says that the Lord will punish the Israelites, for the day she burned incense to the Baals. That's the, that's the pagan god back then. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. So in all, friends, it comes down to the motive of why you're doing this. The outside of someone doesn't matter what they look like. It matters on the inside. Their hair color doesn't matter. Their clothes, doesn't matter. Their jewelry, doesn't matter. Their tattoos, they don't matter. What matters is their heart. When I was the associate pastor at Calvary Baptist, we, youth group was growing, and it was really, it was a lot of fun. And the pastor was so glad to see more and more youth getting involved, whether they're up with the band with me or something like that, or just serving, um, you know, the offering plate. And I remember one newer young girl in our church that um, she was new to Christ. She was new to being a Christian. She was un- trying to understand what it meant. And she was having a great time hanging out with us, learning from us at youth group. And eventually she started coming to church. And that was a, that was a great win to see. Because she started coming and she, they asked her, hey, do you want to like help by serving you know, the, the plates for, for getting the, the offering? And she said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So she came, I think, the next week to do it. She was wearing a really, really short skirt. And so, P, so the pastor and I were like saying, oh, man, like, we, we, let her, we let her do it. And we were just like, should we have said something? Should we have told her to maybe dress more modestly? And so we worked out some parameters for, for the future. But at that moment and at that time, all that mattered to me was that I saw a young Christian believer who wanted to serve the Lord in a way that she could. And so... That's what it came out to. It didn't matter about what she looked like. You know, 1 Samuel talks about this. I love this verse. Chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. So, before you go ahead now and run out and go get a tattoo, (laughs) I want you to ask you, I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. First, Is this tattoo honoring God? You know, not the act of getting a tattoo, but the the content of it. I bet you some of us have some, you know, first tattoos that we're not too proud of. Not because it worships other gods, but that maybe it's just embarrassing. Not really that meaningful to the owner. Now, I want you to take the time to examine your heart fully before you even think about getting a tattoo. You know, I, as I mentioned, I, I plan on getting my own tattoo. And Liz has been like, hey, like, I want to help you, des- I want to help design it. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And I'm still, like, thinking about it. And now after having done this message, I'm like, I have some more ideas. 
especially that Isaiah verse is really cool. And, uh, and you know, here, you know, I am the Lord or something like that along those lines. And I, and I have a mindset of like where it's going to be and, you know, what shape it might be, but I don't have the full content in my, in my head or what I want it to. So I'm not getting it yet because I need to make sure I still want that idea. I want to take the time to plan this. You know, you have to ask yourself, is this tattoo God honoring or is it self-serving? Is it God honoring or is it self-serving? That too is permanent. Like I'm sure many of you talked about with your own kids. I think of an idea that somebody told me. They said, when you have the design in mind, get it on a paper, you know, print a million copies of it, put it everywhere. Put it like, you know, in your kitchen, in the bathroom, in your car, at work, or at school, or wherever. Just so you could see it each and every day multiple times. And that after six months, you've seen that so many times, and you still love that design... I think it might be time to finally get that tattoo because you're still loving. The other question I want you to ask yourself, will this tattoo help you or is it going to hurt you? Will the tattoo hurt you as you enter the career world? We need to be strategic where that tattoo might be. Can it be easily covered up if your boss is not happy that you have one showing? You know, a full head and face tattoo probably won't get you that dream job at the bank. I'm afraid to say that, but that's the case. I also think of those who may have gotten a tattoo, maybe from a friend and not a licensed tattoo artist. I mean, do you know what kind of danger you're putting yourself into physically when that happens? The kind of medical issues you could experience, and that's not even considering, you know, how bad of a job they probably might do on that artistically. Um... I encourage you, look for counsel when making such a big decision in your life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Tattoos are representations of who you are. They tell a story, as we said, most likely about you and who you are. If your motives are to glorify God and his work in your life, then you're following that passage. So I pray your tattoos are leading in that direction as well. There may be somebody here that disagrees with some of the things that I've said today, and that's okay. Tattoos, as I said, are a permanent thing. It's a permanent marking, and it can cost a lot of money to get removed. But there's one marking, and I hope that you can get from this, that you can never get rid of, and I hope you never do. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22 says, He put his mark, Jesus put his mark on us to show that we are his. And he put his spirit in our hearts to be a guarantee for all that he has promised. Now, whether or not you're thinking about getting tattoos or piercings, or you already have them, I'd like to invite you today to let Jesus put his mark upon you. You don't have to get pierced to prove your love for him or get the Lord's tattooed on your hand. You just have to put your faith in him, offering him your heart. As the band comes up, will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the tattoos that have an ultimate meaning in our lives that is related back to you. I pray that the stories of those tattoos might help and encourage someone to know you more. Lord, I pray for those who are thinking about getting a tattoo, whether it's their first one like me or or maybe just one of many, Lord. I ask that you give them discernment, that you give them wisdom, that you give them the knowledge to make a choice that is pleasing to you and that further glorifies your kingdom. Let the artwork of our bodies be pleasing to you and that they may bring others to Christ because of what you have done in our lives. Our stories reflect upon the tattoos in our lives. So we thank you for them because they have created us wonderfully for you. Now, Lord, I pray for those who don't wish to have a tattoo in their life, and that's totally fine, Lord. They want to honor your temple that is honoring you by keeping it from any blemish. They acknowledge that you've created them perfectly, and for that we are thankful for their comprehension of how you have made them in your image, Lord. Thank you that they may appreciate the art that is on others. And that we don't judge others by their outward appearance. Because you love what is in the heart, as Samuel told us, Lord. 
You love us and each and every one of us. For it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. As we remember the per these permanent markings, we remember them at the communion table today. And before we do it, we're going to sing a song. So let's stand and sing.
given us gifts, whether we're up here, whether we're playing an instrument. However we serve you, we thank you that that's what you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we begin in communion, I just wanted to invite uh, Chris up here right now because this is the first time I'm able to lead in, lead in uh, communion, I should say, as an official pastor. So we wanted to bring Chris and help us out with that today. Today we come to the key point of Jesus of Nazareth being here on earth. Historians note that he was beaten, he was bruised, he was killed on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago. We believe that he died and he rose from the dead on that third day in order to be that final lamb to be offered for our sins. He conquered death so that he can bridge the gap between God and us and that we no longer have to be afraid of being alone in this world. He did this so that we might have a choice and choose to follow God. Whether you are a church member here or not, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we invite you to the table today. We find that on that night before his death, Jesus and his disciples were partaking in a Passover meal. Matthew 26 says, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us take a moment now and pray for the bread and for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what we are about to partake in. Lord, you said that we should examine ourselves, that we may approach this communion in humility, Lord, for what you have done for us, how your body was broken and your blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, help us now examine ourselves and realize the grace, the mercy, and the love that you have showed for all humanity as you hung and died on the cross. Lord, this is not a time for us to be ashamed of what you have done for us or the sins that we have committed. But we come humbly acknowledging that they have all been atoned for, for the breaking of your body and the shedding of your blood. And in this we do to you return. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Friends, eat and drink and never hunger or thirst again. Well, just as the disciples did, they sang a hymn after taking, partaking in the Lord's Supper. And so we do the same. Let us stand and let us circle up as we always do every communion Sunday and sing, Bless Be the Tie That Binds. Bless be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind. Is like to that above. Amen. Each year we have a single word that we reflect on and are actively pursuing as a church. 2023, our word is listen. It's something that we forget to do. Our world is busy, it's chaotic, and we forget to listen to those who are in need. 
But Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us, and let's say this together, friends. The point is, before you trust, you have to listen. But unless Christ's word is preached, there's nothing to listen to. It is only by faith that we can understand the wonders of what Jesus Christ has done in our life. But before faith, we must listen to the good news. Yeah. We must take in God's holy word each and every day so that we can truly hear and understand what God is saying in our lives. Yes. We hope that you can join us in listening this evening.